going to do a review of this saw. This is the Grizzly G0771Z 10-inch hybrid table saw. I got this saw in February. It's now August, and I've used it enough that I think I can do a good thorough review. I'm going to start by going through the specifications of the saw, then do some calibration checks, and wrap up with uh, some likes and uh, dislikes. So right to it. The specs are listed right here on the front of the saw. Two horsepower motor pre-wired for 120, but it is convertible to 240. Takes a 10 inch blade. The width of cut to the right is listed at 30. I'm not sure where they're measuring from um, because the fence scale itself goes up to 33 and I've made cuts more than 30 inches. So that's not accurate. Uh, the maximum depth of cut at 90 is three and a quarter. So when the saw is cranked all the way up, which it is for this video, you can cut through three and a quarter inch thick material. Weight is listed at 286. I think that's just the saw carcass excluding the wings, fence rail and fence, because when you factor all that in, it weighs a lot more. The setup was fairly straightforward. Um, this got delivered in a couple of boxes and there was no damage. Everything was included. You just need to block off a couple of hours, to be honest. I was able to put this on the mobile base myself, uh, but if you're gonna do that, I'd recommend putting it on the base before you attach these super heavy cast iron wings. Everything was uh, straightforward. The manual is thorough. Just follow it and you will be fine. The one thing that I had some trouble with, this is the motor housing here. And these screws, if you can see, are not Phillips head. Yet in the manual, they were listed as Phillips. And I spent the longest time searching for these damn Phillips head screws that just didn't exist. Other than that, um, you will be fine. Just take your time. Um, and it sets up uh, just fine. When I set the saw up, I did all of the calibration checks that you're going to see me do here in a second, with the exception of one uh, that I've repeated since. I've not done them since I first set up the saw. So I'm curious to see how well this thing has stayed uh, calibrated after six months of abuse. So getting right to it, the first thing I will do is just hold the camera by the blade. I should point out this is not the stock blade. This is actually a Freud uh, flat top tooth blade. I put this in when I got the saw, so don't ask me how the stock grizzly blade cuts. Don't know. I've never used it. So holding it straight on, which I think it is, let me just flip the saw on and off real quick. That's not too bad. You might notice a little bit of wobble um, at the end there, but I can tell you that doesn't affect quality of cut. My cuts are smooth. They're not jagged. There's no burning. So the fact that it sort of wobbles, if at all, um, is not going to affect your quality of cut. The most important check, I think, is probably checking that these miter slots are parallel to the blade. If they're not, if the blade is off a little bit relative to the miter slots, you're not going to get a 90 degree cut on cross cuts, and you're also not going to get uh, parallel cuts along the rip fence. So um, the blade being parallel to both of those things is very important. I've seen some different methods on doing this. People use a combination square. Many use a dial indicator. This is probably the most accurate way to calibrate. Uh, the miter slots to the blade and, and probably for most other calibration checks on the saw. But I'm going to do something a little bit different. I have uh, this straight edge here. This is just a piece of oak. And I have this laser measure. And what I'm going to do is uh, come on over to this side of the saw. I'm going to take that straight edge and hold it firm against this side of the miter slot. And on the saw, I have a tooth that I've marked with a... Uh, sharpie here and I'm going to try and shoot the laser to hit right at the teeth right at the tooth of the blade for the tooth I've marked so if I hit it right there spot on we read at 10 and uh, 21 30 seconds or 11 sixteenths 
So sliding everything to the left and then moving that same tooth to the left. I'm going to try and hit that blade or that tooth again. I found this to be a little bit difficult. It doesn't want to register right off of that tooth. So, but if I kind of play with it for a second, there. So that's right on the tooth there. And the reading is 10, 21, 30 seconds. So uh, that's good. One of the complaints I've seen with this um, this particular saw and other grizzly saws is that the blade, when it's cranked all the way up, tends to tilt out or tilt up. And, and this does not do that. It's parallel to the miter slot. So that's good. Next, I'm going to check to see if the blade is 90 degrees to the table. Helps if the blade's all the way up to do this. So I can just take a tri-square. And you see there's pretty much no daylight there. And I can check the front. I can check the back. And so that's 90 degrees to the table. The next check I will do is the uh, fence. So just kind of pulling the fence in a little bit. I'm going to go back to that combination square and just see if the fence sits at 90 degrees to the table. And putting the square up against the fence, it looks okay. There's a little bit of daylight, if you can see there. And it rocks just a touch, but closer to the blade itself, it doesn't rock at all. Next check is going to be to see if this fence is 90 degrees to the front of the table. So these miter slots are 90 degrees to the front of the table, and they're parallel to the blade. If this fence is 90 degrees to the table, then it too will be parallel to the blade. So I'm going to use this combination square, and I think I'm just going to grab the straight edge again. So I have uh, something for the square to reference off of. I'm going to put it back, put this square back against the straight edge, hold it firm against the front of the saw. And if I go all the way out to the edge here, 24 inches, it doesn't even open up much at all. Maybe just a tiny little crack, but uh, I wonder if I could even fit a thou worth of a feeler gauge in there. So um, those are all good. Uh, those were all pretty much the same when I set up the saw. And so after six months, they've not shifted much, which is impressive. The last check I want to do is with the fence scale here. This is the one that I've actually repeated a couple of times. When I'm about to make a couple of cuts that need to be consistent, I always check to see if this fence uh, scale is accurate. And the way I do that, I take some uh, digital calipers. These are great, by the way. You should certainly get a pair of these, very handy. And I set it to two. That's just the number I've chosen. And I bring the fence in, get a tooth to measure off of, and just kind of scooting the fence over. Again, difficult to do one-handed. That is pretty much right at two. See, it lines up with the tooth, the blade there. And we come here to the scale, and that's pretty, pretty good. The, the red line might be just a, a hair over, but if that bothers you, it doesn't bother me. But if it bothers you, you can just adjust these Phillips head screws and move um, this window over just a little bit. So those are the calibration checks, and um, I am uh, pleasantly surprised. Um, everything has remained consistent pretty much from the day I set it up. And that's one of the things I really like about this saw. I have noticed that it is remarkably accurate over and over again, miles more accurate than my former saw, which was a job site saw. And I think in large part, that's because these miter slots here are so well milled and consistent and everything rides on top of this cast iron surface, which is also milled very consistently. 
Uh, I like also the fact that it's pre-wired for 120. I am not a professional woodworker. This is not a production shop. I am a hobbyist. And this is a garage, a standard two-car garage. And not many garages that I've encountered have a 240 volt circuit. And if you get two or three, three horsepower or higher saws or full-blown uh, saw stop, powermatic or jet table saws, they typically run off a 240 volt circuit, which you can either install yourself if you know how to do that thing or pay someone to install. And that assumes that you have space in your breaker box to do that. So the fact that I can get this out of the box and plug it right into a standard wall outlet um, is a big plus for me. This thing is also pretty uh, customizable. These cast iron wings, each of them have holes, three holes, and that allows you to attach things to them. Case in point, I've attached this router table to this wing. This was actually all empty space when I got the saw. I will make a separate video probably on, on how I did that. But suffice it to say that this has been a very uh, big improvement in my shop. I can do my table saw cuts and my routing cuts all in one sort of station here. I don't have to have a separate space for a router table. And the fence is quite rigid if I lock it down. And it is also... Uh, got a feature that I really enjoy that makes it customizable. It has these T-slots. You may be surprised. Some people are super, super uh, specific about what type of fence they prefer. Some prefer a Biesemeyer style fence. I think that's what it's called, where it's just all flat. And the worry they have is that for these type of fences, your workpiece is going to get in the slot and move a little bit, and that's going to throw off the accuracy of the cut. I think that's kind of a load of crap. These three points of contact on this aluminum extrusion are more than enough. They're very solid. The thing, if you can see straight down, is uh, very straight. It doesn't bend. And when this fence is locked down and you're careful, stuff is going to ride on this just perfectly. And with these T-slots, you can make a ton of specific jigs that will enhance the saw. So Grizzly sells specific uh, T-slot bolts for this. So you can make a sacrificial fence here um, that you can just attach when you want to put the blade all the way up to the fence. You can make some wraparound jigs like tenoning jigs or spline jigs, things that ride along the fence. Or you can do what I've done. I actually attached a router fence that I made uh, to the saw using just some random bolts I had lying around. Uh, one point of contact and two points of contact and that's it. Um, again, I'll make a separate video, but the advantage here is that although I've seen people make carcasses like this before, uh, they usually have to clamp onto the fence. So you have to find a place to store this. And when you want to use it, you have to dig out the clamps, clamp it on. Here, it's always right on the fence. And that is super convenient. And again, it locks down so solidly and that rigidity helps you when you're passing stuff through on the router table as well. So big fan of that and um, not too many saws that I see for this price that you get that feature in. Uh, the miter gauge is good. It's certainly an improvement over the shitty job site miter gauges that I've grown accustomed to. I'm not sure if I mentioned but these miter gauges are sort of T-slots and this, uh, this uh, I'm sorry, these miter slots are sort of T, and this miter gauge has a bit of a, a T thing on the front of it, so when you put it in the slot, it will stay still and hold itself. So if you have a big, long work piece you need to start away from the saw, that can be helpful. I've not done that yet, but the gauge itself runs very smooth. There's just uh, maybe a little bit of play at the end, but... Again, just hold it straight against one side. You can take that slop out. These wooden pieces obviously do not come with the gauge. Um, but uh, it is good. It's certainly an improvement. I like the cabinet design as well. That really helps with dust collection. All of the dust gets pushed down into the saw, and most of it gets sucked out through this dust collection port. I have it hooked up to a homemade dust collection cart. And that makes uh, capturing all of this dust 
uh, pretty easy operation. The last like of the saw for me is the cost. It was 900 bucks to my door, which sounds like a lot, um, and it is. But you really have to think of a saw like this relative to the cost of other saws. So for example, here is a recent Rockler catalog. I was just flipping through it. Here are three saws that may be roughly comparable. These are contractor saws, which look not as uh, solid. They're open at the bottom here. This Laguna looks pretty similar. But cost-wise, you know, you're talking about $1,400, $1,400, $1,800. And if you want to step up, like I said, to a full-blown saw stop powermatic jet type saw, three, four horsepower, you're talking at least two to maybe three times the price of this saw. The list price of the saw was $750 with lift gate and freight to get it delivered here. And my total was close to $900. I pulled up uh, the saw on Grizzly's website today, and the price has gone up. It's at 845. Freight's gone up a little bit too, so 960, about a thousand bucks to your door. I still think it's worth it at that price. I'm, I'm sorry, I still would have bought it at that price for sure, but you might want to wait until uh, Thanksgiving or the holidays to see if the price comes down. The only two dislikes that I have about this saw really don't concern the operation of the saw itself. One was the delivery. I ordered this in November, you can see here, and it didn't get delivered until almost February, two months, and that kind of sucks. I was hoping to take advantage of the month of December to set this up, and if you're buying the saw as a gift, or if you're buying it with the intention of starting and completing a project by a certain date, those types of delays can be difficult. I don't know if this is a persistent problem with Grizzly. No clue. This is the first thing I bought from them, but uh, just know that. The other thing that I'm not a huge fan of is the fact that this really kind of is not great on a mobile base, particularly on a mobile base that you're going to be moving against a wall and back and against a wall and back or moving around a lot. It gets a little bit tippy. It gets hard to move when sawdust gets caked on the wheels. And this is a mobile base that's made for 1,200 pound tools. So uh, it can hold the saw. It's just still kind of difficult to maneuver. But those are kind of, I don't know, insignificant uh, dislikes. They're kind of first world problem concerns. As far as what the saw is intended to do, it does a fantastic job. I cut box joints with this. I cut things with super tight tolerances, uh, shelves, and things of that nature. And I really could not be more happy. And uh, I will, again, be making other videos about uh, the router table setup and some other things I'll probably do to the saw. But the reason I'm making this video, this isn't uh, sponsored, this isn't uh, promotional uh, content or anything like that. When I was searching for saws, YouTube videos were a fantastic resource, and the more thorough the reviews, the better. So it's the least I can do to make a, a video reviewing this saw. And if you have any specific questions, if I didn't answer something to your liking, let me know and I'll try and answer it. Otherwise, I think that's it. Thanks a lot.